Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It is Thursday noon hour, folks. Ted Ralston here in our Think Tech studios uh, in Waimanalo Beach uh, on Oahu with our show, Where the Drone Leads, where we bring to you incredible people, uh, ac actions, activities, and developments in the exciting world of droneism. With me at the table here in Honolulu is actually Josh Levy. Josh, who's a coordinator at uh, UH uh, Manoa ARL UAS programs. Thanks for coming on again, Josh, a frequent flyer on the show. And a first timer we have on the show, far, far away across the sea. By electronic means, we have none other than J.C. Coffee of many affiliations, and J.C. joins us right now from Washington, D.C. J.C., you there? Hey, greetings. It's great to be with you today, and aloha to all our folks out in Hawaii. I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., so okay. it's, uh, it's good we to be with tell, you. I wish I was sitting with you. We can tell Capitol Hill because we see the mountains and the ocean in the background, so that's cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> just, to, let's, just to let everybody know, J.C., in this particular case, is representing the Cherokee Nation Technology Corporation, a uh, recent participant and winner in the FAA's recently announced uh, UAS integration pilot program as a partner to the University of Alaska. They get it all right, JC? That's exactly right. And it's good to have uh, my teammates from Hawaii sitting there on the other side of the, uh, the Pacific as we're discussing this. Right. We're actually, uh, UH is uh, part of that uh, same winning team. So we're very happy to be on that team and uh, on, on we go forward. But uh, we could also give you many other affiliations, JC. We won't go them, through them all here. But just to let you know, we had a briefing with uh, NASA Ames on Monday. And they kind of casually mentioned that J.C. Coffee's in their Saturday Breakfast Club working on the future of H.A.L.E. So you're everywhere, and I uh, appreciate that. And appreciate your willingness to come on the show and share with us what you picked up yesterday at that incredible announcement at, of the IPP program. So take us through that, if you will. And I know we only have you for a short time here because you've got other obligations. You bet, Ted. And uh, it would have been right up your alley to be there. I mean, there was a lot of energy in the room at a packed Department of Transportation. Uh, the foyer was full with, with industry partners, with people from the FAA Department of Transportation. There was uh, uh, five senators and about 10 congressmen for this announcement. It was a major development for the commercially unmanned aircraft systems or UAS industry as the U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chao, announced the first round of participants in the U.S. Department of Transportation's Unmanned Systems Integrated Pilot Program, the IPP. Uh, the merging technology of UAS industry benefits the public in real and profound ways. Yet while the technology has moved quickly ahead, policymakers has, have lagged behind the technology in the United States. In an effort to move UAS policymakers forward, the White House announced plans last fall for the UAS IPP. The IPP seeks to accelerate the safe integration of UAS into the national airspace and to foster the development of new UAS technologies for use in a wide range of commercial industries. The selectees that were announced yesterday, Ted, were drawn from a highly competitive pool of over 200 tribal, state, and local governments. State and localities from every region in the country submitted applicants, applications showcasing industry partnerships, seeking to satisfy the growing demand from Americans across the country for UAS in support of, as you're experiencing right now, disaster response, infrastructure inspection, package delivery, and much more. And it was so exciting when, you, when they started announcing from a, around the uh, country the different winners. The initial round of selectees were from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, Lee County Mosquito Control District in Florida, our own University of Alaska at Fairbanks, the city of San Diego in California, North Carolina Department of Transportation, Memphis County Airport Authority, uh, the city of Reno, Nevada, North Dakota Department of Transportation, Kansas Department of Transportation, and the Virginia Tech Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership. What you would need to know about the, about the IPP is that it has three primary objectives. One is to test and evaluate various models of state, local, and tribal government involvement in development and enforcement of federal regulations for UAS operations. The second is to encourage UAS owners and operators to develop safe, 
safely and test new and innovative U.S. concept of operations, and finally, to inform the development of future federal guidelines and regulation uh, decisions on U.S. operations nationwide. This is going to be a fast move past Part 107, and that's what we want. So 107 kind of tested, laid the groundwork for us uh, over the last few years. We've had a number of test sites doing developmental tests, and now we're moving into the operational test phase, being able to test this, in this technology, these sensors, these in innovative applications in, in real-world settings and operational environments. And this is kind of what we've done in the military for years. You start off in a laboratory and then go to a test range, and then eventually you go to an operational environment. So now that we're doing this for unmanned systems to get uh, safe, and, and, uh, and nationwide access to the national airspace. And it's really a pleasure that Alaska, who just has some of the most wonderful airspace to test, is partnered with folks like us and in situ and um, with, uh, with you folks down in Hawaii. So we're going to really have a very powerful team, and we'll be able to do a lot of tests. I'll just take a break right there, see if you have any questions, Ted, from you or your team. Well, I appreciate your unscripted uh, report, JC. That was pretty well done. Uh, all from memory, <laughs> I, I see. And uh, uh, we have a teleprompter here, too, but it's showing yesterday's program, so we probably won't use it. But uh, that's, I love it. that's a great uh, introduction and really good summary of the IPP concept in its uh, grandest form. Interpreting that, what that means is local jurisdictions, whatever they may be, federal, state, tribal, uh, commercial, business, educational institutions, all will be able to contribute to the solution of how unmanned air systems will operate below 400 feet in their environment. Is that a way to look at it? No, that, that's a great way to look at it. And while we still may have to ask for waivers if we want to do some of the things that, that are a little bit trickier, i.e. beyond visual line of sight, over people um, at night, uh, those those waivers will be accelerated. There'll be a, a certain level of uh, expanded trust between the government, uh, the FAA, the localities, and industry to to accelerate the, the operational test of, of these different uh, platforms and these different operations. And uh, and boy, we sure hope that getting the data, getting the reliability data, getting the safety data from these uh, from these operations will will help us all get into the airspace a lot quicker. Well, that's really cool. And what, what intrigues me is the engineering aspects that are lurking behind that yet to be discovered. Uh, we talk, you talked about reliability and safety. Certainly, those requirements at, a, at, a, at an operational level as they play out require design at the component level on the way in. So a higher level of appreciation of the need for that kind of a cohesive study, systems engineering-wise, to make sure these things are reliable and do what they say and do it the same way every time, regardless of the influences placed upon them, and the, the training provided to the operators matches that. These are all issues that are going to be coming around the corner here. And uh, Josh and I, we certainly have had our experiences uh, here with uh, where the other side of that is playing out, as I'm sure everybody has. And so uh, seeing how this all plays together uh, and how the FAA stirs the pot and keeps it all heading in the right direction is going to be actually a pretty, uh, a, a pretty good learning experience for all of us. And, and you know what's great, Ted? You, your team out there, you have it all. You have the technologists, you have the scientists, you have the engineers, you have the innovators. But then you also have the policymakers, and you understand the regulations, and you understand how to influence those regulations um, to get better access to the, uh, to the airspace. And it's one of the things that the Secretary Chow really highlighted. She left the quote that, that the pilot programs will test the safe operations of drones in a variety of conditions currently forbidden. These include operations over the heads of people, beyond line of sight, and at night. The secretary went on to said, instead of a dictate from Washington, this program takes another approach. It allows interested communities to test drones in a way that they're comfortable with. And you folks out there are pioneering this effort, and I, I just can't wait to get to work with you uh, on the IPP for this. Well, that's very good. And, and of course, we have our, uh, prior to the IPP kicking in and becoming totally effective, we have our own uh, legislative-driven uh, UAS working group across all the elements of the society out here to try to figure out how to make this work within the community. And, uh, and then we have the test range functionality, so we have the ability to do some of this work uh, already. In fact, uh, Josh and I have been doing that, 
And it's intriguing that you're saying that you're describing how IPP is working. Put it in the hands of the users out there in the jurisdictions. Just as a matter of interest, uh, the Marine Corps is doing the same thing. They haven't quite figured out how to determine what overtly determine on a forward path how to use small UAS in the at the squad level. So they're putting twenty eight hundred of them in, out there to all the squads and saying, "You guys figure it out. You E threes, you go figure out how to make this thing work." And we, the officers, will back off. We'll j remove the barriers and let you go forward and then uh, keep you safe. But uh, coming out of this will be a very similar activity to what is going on in IPP, as I, as I now see it. Yep. So, and, uh, that's not, right. Uh, Josh Lee. You know, oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah. Speak up. Go ahead, JC. Yeah, so I, I'm just, I was just going to say, yeah, those lucky the Marines that, that, that get the test in, in paradise, <laughs> namely Hawaii, um, the, besides having pristine airspace out there, you just have uh, a paradise to test in. So those lucky Marines that get to do it out there, I'm all for them. <laughs> ah, that lucky, that, but, but you just said something most interesting, that, that, uh, that, that environment that you speak of is full of salt air. And so circuit boards and salt air weren't born in the same domain, right? Yeah. Airspace so, uh, is not so clean. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, this is that, that's a very intriguing aspect because the, ch the, the environmental challenge we have here is exactly that, salt air affecting electronics and such, and that drives right back to reliability and safety. So yeah. what we can do, though, maybe, yeah. maybe what you should do, JC, is re-enlist and come back. <laughs> do you think they'd take you as an E3? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, as an old salty sailor, I know a little bit about corrosion. And, and what I like about our team is the fact that we can do that, uh, that maritime testing, that salt water testing, the, the ship testing down at your place, and then uh, then do our Arctic testing right up at, uh, with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, our, our lead for uh, our IPP. So, you know, there's perfect timing for, uh, for the, the different toughest uh, testing environments in the world, and we can cover two of them right there between Hawaii and Alaska. Yep, and just as a matter of, of interest, we ha do have a, a high-tech company in town right down the street from us here called Ocean. It is a 150 strong, really good SBIR guys, and uh, they've got some incredible coating technology, some of which from Hawaii is in place in Alaska, dealing with uh, ice phobic coatings on control surfaces and such to keep ice from forming on small UAS. Also corrosion coatings, and uh, we're going to be exploring Further kind of coatings in terms of uh, bug uh, attraction and such like this to uh, laminar flow wings. So there's there's technology that's necessary to make these things happen. Uh, anyway, uh, now we're going to lose you in a few minutes, right? You got to take off to take care of uh, the next piece of business. That's right. That's right. But uh, just one one quick closing. It was uh, interesting today. We had the FAA kickoff meeting. And uh, uh, we had uh, the, the leads from all the teams over at the FAA, and, and uh, the FAA leadership gave us their, their initial briefing. And, and it's really time to roll up our sleeves and start um, getting ready to do some flying and getting ready to do some really fun and, uh, and envelope pushing as pioneers and as test guys out there. So uh, this is going to be exciting. Exciting next couple of years, we're going to be doing this through 2020, and it's going to be um, just loads of fun. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly looking forward to working with doing our part of the team here at, in Hawaii and uh, with both technology, test ranges, and operations. And uh, we can certainly bring the power of the university to bear on us, as well as the high-tech companies that surround us here, and uh, do something, whatever we can, to make this thing move forward. And we do have, right in front of us, the Kilauea situation, which is attracting all yeah. kinds of uh, UAS attention, and we have to use this, I think, as a setup for a future IPP task of some kind, because all the elements that are, that are valuable that UAS provide and all the issues that uh, Incident Command System has to think about in terms of in injecting new technology are all present in this one time. So we'll be, in the next couple of weeks, developing, I think, uh, a lot of use case based uh, needs and uh, requirements and such that can shape some of these future initiatives we're talking about. So, JC, we'll, uh, we, we've taken you to the end of the time you've given us. We thank you very much for that. Unless you want to stick around for the next 15 minutes, we will be uh, unhappy to cut you loose, but we understand you've got obligations. Chad, I'm going to monitor you from afar, but uh, I want to wish you and your team and the people from Hawaii a lot of luck dealing with this natural disaster, uh, the, the volcanoes, and, uh, and God bless you all. Okay, well, same to you, JC, and thanks so much for coming on. We'll have you again once you're on this show. you got to come back. Next time you're in Hawaii, we'll get you at the table here for real. 
And uh, at this point, we'll take our, our one and only break in the show and uh, let JC unplug and get on to other business. Thanks so much, JC Coffee, for coming on. Thanks, all, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Hello, I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. I have a show called Finding Respect in the Chaos. It's all about women's rights and gender equality. It's a place for survivors of abuse to come on and tell their stories, and a place for advocates to come on and share important resources so that people can get past the abuse and into the hope and healing that's on the other side. I hope you'll join me every other Friday at 3 o'clock for Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair on thinktechhawaii.com. Hey, hey, baby, that's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on Pacific Partnerships in Education here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every other week, Tuesdays at 3 p.m., we have guests on and talk about the fascinating, interesting, and unique partnerships in education that occur across the Pacific Islands with Hawaii, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, Palau, Guam, all these places have really rich local education programs going on, and the exchange among and between these programs is a wealth of great information, helping the islands all learn how to survive and thrive in our ever-changing world. I hope you'll join us on Pacific Partnerships in Education. It is still the noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here in downtown Honolulu, and uh, we've uh, disconnected from uh, J.C. Coffey, who's in D.C. and going off on other business, but Josh Levy, thanks for coming on board. Josh, our coordinator at UHARL on unmanned systems and a generator of a lot of interest and enthusiasm across the university domain and into the high schools and into the business community around here in, in Hawaii. Anyway, Josh uh, just had a very exciting discussion here on something that uh, uh, it was taking place in D.C. yesterday that we contributed to, but uh, got involved in through secondary means. That was the FAA IPP program, or the Integrated uh, Pilot Program for UAS Operations. But it'll be fantastic to see how that plays out here in Hawaii. But you just came back from another overwhelming experience uh, <laughs> in uh, Denver. Yep. Talk about it. Yeah, so I, was, I spent the last week in Denver at the AUVSI Exponential, which essentially is you know, one of the world's largest drone or all things unmanned uh, conventions where they have a whole bunch of different sessions on a variety of different topics, ranging from public safety to scene avoid to very technical um, you know, in, uh, vehicle inspection. This is the annual inspections. gathering of this bunch. What, exactly, this happens every year. or something like that? Yeah, probably around there. Um, definitely more than I can count. Um, and then an entire, you know, almost square mile full of expo halls of people selling different things, ranging from, from LIDAR systems to uh, full aircraft, engines, motors. Uh, Pratt & Whitney was there, actually. Big stuff hanging in the sky and little stuff on the table? Exactly, yeah, ranging from giant aircraft to, you know, circuitry. So, as long as there's nobody on it, <laughs> yeah. unmanned. Exactly, not a single pilot seat. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was extremely interesting. I mean, it was... Um, well, one of the themes that I was realizing as I was speaking to other people who I'd seen there in, pre in previous years is how it's still a massive, uh, massive expo hall, but it's actually starting to condense a little bit. You know, people are starting to figure out what works, what doesn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Businesses, businesses starting to merge. Even aircraft types and platform setups, such as the VTOLs, um, are starting to condense to so a, a certain a form factor. Consolidation of thinking, and, and that's following it, following up with actual physical change. Exactly, yep. Yeah, so people are figuring out what works and they're starting to kind of condense and and, and Do you move think it'll get down to the size of holding it at the Hawaii Convention Center here in Honolulu? Maybe, that would be quite the undertaking. I mean, we could, we could probably fit it there. That would bring Asia in. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah, significantly more than they have right now. I mean, there, was, there were a couple of, um, you know, they had these international kind of corners of a couple of booths here mm -hmm. and there from, you know, some from Denmark, a couple from, from, from Japan, but yeah, bring it to Honolulu, you have like, you know, almost half Let's the thing would be China. speak to the people at HIC, mm -hmm. uh, or H, what, Hawaii Convention Center, whatever it's called, and, uh, and 
bring some pictures, videos, or whatever you can from last week's experience. Mm -hmm. Let's bring it here. Let's talk to our people about bringing this here, just like with hats off to Wayne Sharoma for bringing the IEEE conference here last year. Right. Yep. No, it'll be a very similar, very similar caliber. And we have the yep. test range. So we can actually accommodate real flying and such like that. Yeah, they actually did have some real flying over in Colorado, too. Um, they had a couple of uh, uh, fenced off areas or I guess netted off areas inside the actual expo hall for drone racing. So they had a whole mini drone racing booth out there. Um, you could hear them reverberating throughout the entire hall. Um, and then on the outside, we didn't actually go see this, but in the parking lot, they had some actual real, real demos out in the, in the open air, too. We could use that patio, the lanai, in the, in the convention center here. Yep. Just uh, wall it off with uh, DNLR's expired fishing nets that we can get <laughs> for free and run inside. Yeah, or even you know, you go to the top floor and build some kind of a dome over that area, too. That'd be a lot of fun. What did you see in terms of the educational involvement at this conference, or what, what could you say take from that experience and bring it to our educational theme here? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So education, um, most of the stuff that they were focused on at, at this expo, just because it is a commercial expo, um, was actually public safety based. So there was a lot of there was a huge two day session ran by Chuck Warner actually. Mm -hmm. um, Hello, Chuck. Yeah, hey, Chuck. Um, on, on public safety, and, and a lot of that was actually trying to figure out how do we educate not only um, not only the general public on you know proper use of UAS, but also how do you educate the folks within the public safety entities and whether it's proper um, you know properly operating them or understanding those, those rules and regulations to enforce UAS um, policies. Um, and so the the standardization of, of being able to actually um, you know quantify someone's skill level of how they can fly. Um, is a really important thing nowadays, and especially as we're you know, talking about like, the Kilauea situation. You know, folks are coming up to all these guys at UH Hilo saying, hey, I can fly, I can fly. How do maybe we know that? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Right. Exactly. Yeah. How do we know? Where's your certificate? How do I know that that standard is up to you know, our acceptable levels? And so you know, the NISC, National Institute of um, Standards and Technology, testing, testing, testing. Yeah. Um, has developed really impressive apparatus to not only train people, but actually quantify you know, how good people are at flying. Um, so trying trying to bring that out to to the state of Hawaii, not only for public safety, but even for um, at the UH level, um, understanding how well you know um, how well students can operate these vehicles, so that they can be you know, not only for insurance purposes, but so we can actually go out there and, and do the jobs that we promise people. So to bringing do. standards into the game, operationally, educationally, design-wise, all those things are starting to show up at the national level. That's exactly. What you're yeah, and so you know, for the past couple of years, we've been hearing standards are being made. You know, we're working on this, working on this, and this is the first time that I've actually seen some you know physical, tangible evidence of, of stuff that we can do out here that we can help standardize across can the we, country. So the kind of contacts you made, can we bring some of that information forward to? feed to our legislature, through the legislation working group that we've got? Absolutely. I mean, I, those guys are more than happy to help. I'm, I'm sure that, that, that Chuck and all the other guys at, at NIST would be more than happy to have their standards um, you know, explored throughout the rest of the country, especially Hawaii. And can you do that? Can you make that connections and uh, cause this stuff to come out here? Yep. I'll just put that on my next list of things to do. Today. Right. Okay. That's not very long. <laughs> your list, right? Yeah. yeah. So standards and people recognizing the needs for standards. The important part is people recognize the needs for standards. Exactly. The admission that that's a critical issue. Uh, says that we don't have any, or that they're coming from places that don't quite apply. So now we have to regenerate standards in a way that do, that does apply to the situation. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so actually, the I was at a workshop before the the big AUVSI conference as well, and that was more of a Colorado specific um, public safety and uh, kind of getting people to try and understand what the FAA is doing, and including a little bit about the FAA IPP as well. And it was it was pretty clear there that a lot of people are frustrated with the current FAA rules and regulations. Um, specifically, well, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the details here, but it was it was really eye-opening, and that was actually one of the more informative workshops I've had. Just for a couple, it was just for one day. It was maybe you know 25, 30 people, but they were all extremely knowledgeable on their topics of expertise, and uh, gave us a lot of really interesting insight on, on what what needs to be done in terms of getting um, the capabilities of public safety to start using um, these new technologies consistently and legally. So what we need to do, I think, in our obligation at UH and our obligation to the legislature, who has funded this activity is uh, to pull together what you can from that in as understandable a form as it may be, and let's get it out to this quote-unquote drone professionals group that we seem to have put together. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, uh, Kevin, and we've got uh, uh, Craig, we've got, uh, we got David, we've got um, Mike, all that whole bunch, and let's start getting this stuff spread out in yep. some way. Absolutely. I still have to go through you know, a foot-tall okay. set of leaflets and flyers and business cards to figure out you know, what actually works, what doesn't, but when we get through that, you we can assign definitely... it to Joshua, can't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, well he, he's well, he's got his own, he's got his own stack of leaflets too. Okay. 
So, so well, actually, we're still trying to undig from the January episode in, in Melbourne, Florida. We haven't yep. even really undug from that yet. So there's, this is an interesting point then. There's a lot of information coming. And the way that we filter and sort that and make use of it is probably the same as California or as Arizona or as Colorado would. So maybe a thing we can send back to AVUSI is say, hey, why don't you guys organize this stuff in some way that's useful commonly to all of us? Yeah, but, but at the same time, I mean, as, as we were saying before, you know, the, the, the specific needs in, in, in California, Florida may be different from what we Correct. want here, yeah. too. So there's a little bit of, a, of an interesting kind of nuances between, you know, who, who needs what depending on where they are. Okay. But it's, I mean, going back to trying to figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't, you really have to have some kind of experience understanding what doesn't work so you actually know what to look for and what things make sense, right? And the what doesn't work part, uh, that only comes about by experience. Exactly. It's a pretty tall list, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's about right. So uh, once again, thinking, we have the unspoken obligation to figure out how to work this at the state of Hawaii level, which is the university, the community colleges, and then into the high schools. Mm -hmm. We've begun connecting with Marianol, with Kamehameha, uh, with uh, Castle, with uh, groups like that, uh, Pacific America Foundation. So. There's a bunch of folks who are ready to receive all this information if we can generate it. Yep, and we've got to so, put it down into these bite-sized chunks that people can take yeah, away. Yeah, maybe it's just and, one piece at a time exactly. rather than the whole meal all at one yeah, time. Yeah, you don't want to feed them out of a fire yeah. hose, right? Yeah. So we've got to make sure that we, whether it's designating a specific task to each of those each of those entities or maybe giving all of them that one piece to chew on together and see what they come up with, um, we've got to figure out a way to, to do this in a digestible manner. Okay, and I think we could do that in the, in the light of what's taking place at Kilauea, mm -hmm. so people can see the reality of where it fits in and, and where, why it's important to pay attention to this. Absolutely. So somehow we have to take this on, uh, maybe Saturday or something like that, in, in between <laughs> the other things we've got going, yep. and, uh, and, and move forward. Anyway, uh, it's certainly an exciting week for uh, all the aspects of uh, unmanned aerial systems, and I just wonder what next week holds in store for us. Who knows? Who knows? Exactly yeah. right. So anyway, uh, we thank uh, JC Coffee for coming on from Cherokee Nation uh, at the, in, in D.C. earlier in the show. Josh Levy, thanks for coming on for the coordinator role at UH and telling us what you're, you, just, you just defined your role, what that coordination is all about. <laughs> yep. Uh, for the state of Hawaii and the betterness of all of us. So anyway, thanks very much for coming on. And uh, folks, we will see you next Thursday.